recording. Uh, should be recording. Excellent. Okay, so thank you all for coming on to the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative webinar series. This is regulations that apply to moving firewood right now. And um, I gave this webinar um, in almost the exact same format last year, and it was really well received. People really enjoyed learning about all the different types of regulations that apply to firewood. And before I get completely deep into the um, world of the regulations themselves, we need to get through a little bit of terminology because otherwise this presentation won't make any sense. So let's start right there. As soon as I can figure out how to move this slide. There we go. So a quarantine. Um, the quarantines that we talk about uh, are two different types. There's, they're both geographic boundaries that create the isolation of some sort of a threat, but they are um, either an external quarantine, which keeps bad things out of a defined area that you want to protect, or an internal quarantine. Now, confusingly, sometimes people call an internal quarantine just a quarantine, because that is the traditional type of quarantine. And that keeps bad things inside of a defined area to protect everything farther away from it. So for instance, right now in the state of Washington, they have a measles epidemic, uh, an, a measles kind of spot infestation that's going on within mostly children. So that's an internal quarantine. You wanna keep those measles from coming out of those counties where measles has been occurring. So there you go. That's quarantines. Further, regulated items. So a regulated item is something that can serve as a carrier for the problem that you're regulating so that it is also regulated. So the, obviously the regulated item that I'm going to be talking about is primarily firewood, but regulated items can be almost literally anything. When it comes to aquatic invasive species, water can be a regulated item. When it comes to um, forest pests and pathogens, things like firewood, um, uh, nursery trees and soil, um, mulch, those are kind of typical regulated items that you might think about. So when I talk about a regulated item in the course of this presentation, please think to yourself that I am talking mostly about firewood. Okay, this is a lot of information, but what I want you to know is that there are three different levels of heat treatment that can be typically applied to regulated items in order to move across a quarantine boundary. So this is combining all of our vocab into a single spot. So the three different levels of treatment, which are temperature and the amount of time at that temperature, are listed kind of towards the middle of this chart and they are treatment level 314A, B, and C. On the chart, I have them listed according to coolest <laughs> to hottest. So that is actually not in ABC order. That's why it's a little confusing. Um, but as you can see, different treatments apply, which is on the far right, to different things. So the coolest of the heat treatment standards applies to gypsy moth, which is an external um, infester of firewood. It doesn't get deep into the wood. Whereas the hottest treatment level required before you can move a, a regulated item outside of a quarantine is the one that applies to Asian longhorn beetle, which burrows deep into the heartwood of hardwood trees. And so it's really, really well insulated. You need a really hot treatment for a really long time in order to adequately treat it. So that is treatment manual code 314C. Um, this is uh, you know, an important system because if we mandated that all treatments be as hot and long as possible, you'd be wasting a lot of energy and money in a commercial system. On the other hand, if you mandated that all the treatments were really low, you wouldn't actually accomplish your goal, which is to kill the pests within it. So if we said, okay, well, we're just all gonna use 314B, like gypsy moth, and there was Asian longhorn beetle infesting in the wood, you wouldn't actually kill it. So that's why there's multiple treatment levels. So in order to divide up the universe in a way that makes sense in terms of regulations that apply to firewood, um, you could do it a number of different ways. You could just say, okay, well, let's review every single regulation in every province, every country, and every state um, in North America. So you'd have, you know, 50 states, uh, it's 12 Canadian provinces, and then two 
countries. Um, I don't actually do a lot of work in Mexico, uh, so I'm just going to pretend that North America constitutes US and Canada for the sake of this presentation, even though that obviously geographically is not accurate. Um, but if you did it by every province and every state, it wouldn't make any sense um, because that's not how these things work and also because a lot of them are identical. So instead, in the course of creating this presentation initially last year, I decided to break them into conceptual categories. And those are pest-driven regulations, which are specific regulations on either federally regulated pests or a forest pest of concern that is not federally regulated. And we'll get to that as to the difference between the two. Um, spatially drawn regulations, which are regulations that pertain to a boundary or a border or a concept, but actually are um, drawn on those edges. So for instance, the borders between two countries, the Canadian US border, of course, um, the edges of a state in order for a state to declare itself either um, to declare an external quarantine to prevent the entry of pests, um, some other land owning entity, so for instance, a state parks authority, a national park or similar, or confusingly, the less than state geographic boundary, which is essentially um, the area that is a part of a state that is protected. And that comes into play, especially when you, there's a very limited infestation area in a particular state of a pest of concern. Then we have the third group of regulations, which is a distance from origin regulation. There aren't too many of these that are actually on the books, but those that do exist are important. And those are regulations that say you cannot move firewood um, farther than a given X number of miles or kilometers from where it was initially harvested or processed. Again, if anybody has questions, I've got you all on mute. So please enter them in the group chat. I have the box open on the far right of my screen. I don't believe you can see that. And so I'll be able to answer questions from there. So in terms of that first category, the pest driven regulations, the federally regulated pests are all held under regulation by USDA APHIS, which is um, the US Department of Agriculture Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And specifically within the plant protection and quarantine um, division, I think you would call it, are all these different pests that I've listed here that are currently listed as federally regulated pests. Now, you may have heard that there's a process underway right now to evaluate whether or not that regulation can be lifted from emerald ash borer. And in that case, that would no longer be on this list of a pest-driven regulation with a federal regulation from USDA APHIS. But that doesn't mean that it can't be limited in, firewood could not be limited in its movement um, from emerald ash borer infested areas to other areas were states to drive the regulations. So we'll get to the state-based regulations later. I just wanted to make that clear early in the presentation. So of these particular pest-driven regulations, all the regulated items that could be infested with these particular pests have to either be heat treated or not be moved outside of their regulated area, which is of course just the area where they have been determined to be infesting. Um, these are not to scale. Massachusetts, it's not bigger than New York, but this is where Asian longhorn beetle currently is known to be located. That is Ohio, New York, and Massachusetts. Very limited, small infestations found in those three states. Um, they are all under eradication efforts. Um, and actually this map is ever so slightly the tiniest bit inaccurate because the little tiny red spot in the top left of the black square in Ohio has actually been eradicated, which is great. So the larger red blob that you can see there in the Ohio infestation is still um, under management, but the other area actually has been sort of blinked out, which is good. Um, you are not allowed to move firewood out of these red uh, mapped areas, they're regulated items uh, are not allowed to be removed unless they have been heat treated to the standards we looked at before. Likewise, emerald ash borers, currently regulated pest. Um, this is a map of the regulated area, which is the blue line that is somewhat irregular around various states. The red dots are the first location in a given county, and so when the counties are big, those dots can be more spread out or when the counties are small, they might be tighter. That does not mean that there's more emerald ash borer there. Uh, you can also see that the regulated area for emerald ash borer does not tightly conform to the found initial county detection dots. So for instance, Southern Georgia, 
all of Georgia is under the regulated area. However, only northern Georgia is known to have emerald ash borer. So the regulated area is not necessarily in um, tight correspondence with the um, findings of the emerald ash borer. This also does not include all of the emerald ash borer locations found in uh, Canada. You are not allowed to move ash, or excuse me, you're not allowed to move hardwood firewood out of the blue zone into the other zones. Um, you can see that the other zones of the country um, have both natively occurring ash, which is the green mapping, and also the um, yellow blotches, which are kind of hard to see in this presentation, represent urban plantings of ash. So anything that comes out of that zone is a threat to the uh, out of the blue zone and into the other area is a threat to the other area. And you're not allowed to move firewood out of that region. It used to be that the emerald ash borer quarantine had a very similar looking feel to the European gypsy moth quarantine, but that is no longer the case. Emerald ash borer has spread much faster and has fewer management tools than European gypsy moth, and so this quarantine is now a lot smaller. Nonetheless, you cannot move many materials out of these quarantined areas into the adjacent or non-adjacent areas because of the presence of European gypsy moth. This also includes things like mulch because gypsy moth um, egg cases are, uh, don't require phloem to mature like uh, emerald ash, excuse me, like emerald ash borer does. So gypsy moth rules are a little bit different, but firewood of any species is a quarantined and regulated item throughout the um, European gypsy moth area, which means you cannot take it from the brightly colored counties out into the other ones. Giant African land snail, which is one that a lot of people don't think about, has a quarantined area down in Southern Florida where a bunch of snails got out and have been infesting residential and um, industrial areas within the greater Miami region. This infestation seems to be um, declining in size due to the active eradication efforts, which is really great. Giant African land snail, or just giant African snail, depending on who you ask. It's a really damaging, enormous snail. It's like as big as your hand. Um, it can cause structural damage to buildings. Um, it devastates trees, as well as I believe it's carnivorous, so it can eat other snails and other slow-moving prey. Pine shoot beetle. This is an interesting one because it's been under a potential deregulation for a long time, but that has not yet been um, brought to completion as I understand it. And so you cannot bring pine articles out of the red areas um, because they are a regulated item and into any other part of the United States or Canada, red or pink, I should say. So this is a lesser known regulation that definitely applies to firewood in terms of pine firewood. The imported fire ant quarantine is a federally regulated pest and um, all the areas that are lit up in the red and pink have infestations of imported fire ant. You might think that it's a, entirely absurd to think that somebody would move fire ant infested firewood. If it's cold, they're dormant. And so when you get to the northern edges of this range especially, you could actually quite easily accidentally pick up firewood that had been infested with a fire ant queen and pack it up and not notice that you have done so. So this isn't quite as absurd as it really seems on the surface. Additionally, there are many, many other and far more relevant quarantined items, regulated items, excuse me, when it comes to imported fire ants. So for instance, hay is a really problematic one. Anything that's in contact with the bare soil could become infested with imported fire ants. So this does mean firewood piles that have been piled just, you know, in your backyard or whatever could become infested. And that is why this is one of the ones that we talk about when we talk about firewood. P. ramorum, Phytophthora ramorum, is also known as sudden oak death. This particular um, disease of trees is really tricky because it requires some pretty complex systems in order to reproduce, um, but it can be spread on splashed soil. So much less the like much like the imported fire ant is a threat when you from the firewood perspective, when you move firewood that has been stored on the ground, particularly if it's really cold out, um, similarly, you could theoretically be moving sudden oak death, P. ramorum, if you moved firewood that had been stored in an area that had dirt um, attached to it, and then when you brought it to somewhere else, if it was adjacent to a potentially susceptible tree. So while this is not a particularly likely scenario and it's not a top threat, it definitely is still a regulated item for the quarantine area in California and that little piece of Southern Oregon.
So those are all of the um, federally regulated pests that have geographic boundaries that include a internal quarantine, making sure that the threat does not leave that geographic area. Then we get into these pest-driven regulations that are similar, but they are not federally regulated. And the ones that I want to highlight in this presentation are four different ones. We have mountain pine beetle, which is a native insect to the Western United States, but not to the Eastern United States. Rapid ohia death, which is a pathogen um, that uh, is currently causing great damage in Hawaii. Spotted lanternfly, which is a plant sucking insect found in the greater Pennsylvania area right now. And thousand cankers disease of walnut, which is a beetle fungal complex that infests members of the walnut family. These are not federally regulated. So USDA APHIS does not currently hold a regulation that um, controls the movement of regulated items pertaining to these particular pests. Starting with the western, um, with the mountain pine beetle, this is a tricky one because it's a, it's a native pest and where I live in Montana, it's got um, natural cycling that it does in terms of years where it kills a lot of pine trees and years where it doesn't kill a lot of pine trees. But of course, it is isolated um, by the Great Plains geographically in terms of its long-term evolution. However, there's two different ways that it could reach the pines of the eastern forests, which is what you're seeing here. Um, one is that could do, it could do the up and over, as you can see, um, which is only possible due to the effects largely of climate change warming up and the range of pine beetle being capable of moving them that far north. I mean, that's parallel to Hudson Bay um, over the entire range and getting into the historical um, area where it has never been before. The other one is firewood from the states. So moving in terms of um, commercial products or personal firewood products from its historical range in the Western United States over. And that's why um, there are quarantines that say that you're not allowed to bring pine, pine firewood or pine logs or any kind of real pine product from states with naturally occurring mountain pine beetle infestations like Montana into the Great Lakes area. The next one uh, that we talked to, that I mentioned before on the listing is rapid ohia death. Um, last year, this was only found on one island. Unfortunately, which is the island of Hawaii, um, you can see the multicolored dots. There was a big increase in discoveries in 2005, and then we had um, sort of slower progress. A bunch of discoveries in 2017, and then in 2018, there was not only three new locations found on Hawaii, but one new location on Kauai. Um, these, the Kauai is actually pretty far to the west if you look at the map of the Hawaiian Islands. I had to remind myself of how this works, but I mean, we're talking from one island to another. It's like really far away, so that's obviously pretty disturbing stuff. There is a regulation saying that you cannot move any kind of potential, um, potentially infested materials from the island of Hawaii to any other island. So the ohia tree is one of the dominant canopy trees, so this includes firewood, um, arts and crafts, structural wood, uh, whatever. You're not allowed to move it. Because this is a fungus, um, it is also potentially in the soil. And so soil is also um, one of the concerns that they have in terms of the inter-island movement of this uh, pathogen. Spotted lanternfly right now um, is a major problem. It does not burrow into firewood, to be clear. It is an external infester. So much like the gypsy moth is found on the outside material, of a piece of firewood um, when it lays its eggs. The spotted lanternfly has a very similar biology in terms of how it could spread. Right now, this map is the best one that I was able to find to summarize the situation of spotted lanternfly. If you look at the center of the map, you'll note that there are, uh, I think it's 12 counties for Pennsylvania that are blue and circled in red. That's the quarantined area according to the state of Pennsylvania. To the east of that are four or three, excuse me, counties in New Jersey that are quarantined in terms of the New York perspective. So because this is not a federally quarantined pest, each state is free to put in, well, no matter what, every state is able to put in place its own regulations. In this case, this map is drawn from the New York perspective. So New York says if you're in those two red zones there, the Pennsylvania red zone and the New Jersey red zone, then you're under um, 
quarantine, as well as if you're in um, northern Delaware or northern Virginia. That's because those are the locations where spotted lanternfly right now is understood to be breeding in limited amounts um, or in excessive amounts in the case of parts of Pennsylvania. Um, and, it, and New York does not want anything from there. Now, it's tricky because those gold areas have, you know, very limited number of finds, perhaps even a single dead individual. And so the map is a little bit difficult to read, but what you can see is that this has a tremendous amount of ability to um, spread potentially really far due to human activity. These are not all contiguous. Some of these counties are really far away from the adjacent counties. For instance, that New York spot up in Monroe County or Albany County, it's very discontinuous with the main infestation area. So firewood is absolutely one of the ways that this can be moved from the core infestation, which is quarantined um, in the blue area, out to these other locations accidentally. Okay, last but not least in the non-federally uh, regulated pest division is the thousand cankers disease of walnut. I was not able to find a more um, up-to-date map, but I don't believe it has changed. Thousand cankers disease is found in all of the stripy states, either um, in the walnuts of the West, where they are um, a commonly occurring tree that is um, both planted and wild, as well as in the East, where black walnut is a native tree. Um, it is not really clear um, how damaging this pest will be over the, um, the long arc of history. There's been some really fascinating new research out about how it does not kill trees nearly as rapidly in some of the eastern settings. Nonetheless, all the states that have marked that on this map are marked in that sort of orangey tan have an external quarantine saying that you cannot bring any kind of um, hardwood firewood or uh, walnut-based firewood or walnut-based product depending on the specific state and specific quarantine, and some of them are different, from any of the stripy states into any of the tan states. Now, some of the tan states that are stripy have a quarantine anyway, and that's because they only have very limited infestations of thousand cankers disease within their state. So for instance, let's just say Ohio, you know, there's not a lot of thousand cankers disease there and they certainly don't want more. And so they still have an external quarantine even though they also have a confirmed infestation area. And those are state-based regulations because again, these are not, this last group of four is not a federally regulated pest. Um, all right, so that takes care of the pest-driven regulations. Now we're gonna to go to spatially drawn regulations. So that includes international boundaries, uh, individual states, landowning entities, and not entirely as big as states, geographic boundaries. So uh, the international borders have uh, very clear regulations for what you cannot bring across the border. Um, Canada um, regulates things that are entering, okay. Let me, let me back it up. <laughs> when it comes to Canada from the US perspective, if you want to take firewood from a source in Canada into the United States, it has to comply with customs and border protection regulations. That's what CBP is. Um, there's heat treatment required. And you can't just bring anything in. That's either commercial or personal. If you want to bring firewood from inside the United States up into Canada, CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, via CBSA, which is Canadian Border Services Agency, will regulate that. Um, again, that is both personal firewood and commercial firewood is regulated if it's moving from the United States up into Canada. As you might suspect, the places where this is most important to really understand are places um, with a border with Canada. So for instance, when I tell people what I do for a living, you know, and I, let's just say like a cocktail party situation. And I remember I live in Montana. They'll be like, oh, that's why they took my firewood when I was trying to go to Banff, which is a national park in Canada. And I'll be like, yes, that's exactly why they took your firewood. You're not allowed to bring firewood that is harvested in the state of Montana up into a national park in Canada or Canada at all. So people recognize that if they've ever had a um, experience at the border. In terms of Mexico, um, you have a very similar situation where if you want to bring firewood from Mexico into the United States, Customs and Border Protection regulates that through the rules set forth by USDA APHIS. Those rules are actually quite a bit more lax from the Mexico to 
um, United States perspective in that you can actually bring in personal firewood with no heat treatment from Mexico. Um, that is because of various different both political and ecological reasons. Um, into Mexico from the United States, that's regulated by CONAFOR, um, which is basically, you know, their equivalent to the Forest Service. Um, I believe that um, that is mostly a commercial regulation. I am fairly certain that you are indeed permitted to bring small personal amounts of firewood from the U.S. into Mexico. But, um, of course, please don't take my advice and, uh, until you double check if you're ever taking a trip into Mexico. Uh, Customs and Border Protection is also in charge of enforcing all of the many regulations, including the heat treatment regulations of overseas firewood coming into the United States. Now, keep in mind, this sounds really crazy because why would you be taking firewood from Europe and bringing it into the United States? Well, it happens, and it actually happens a great deal, especially places that have extremely low labor cost and developing economies can cut firewood and move it for surprisingly low amounts of money, relatively speaking, and firewood is actually imported into the United States, especially from former Soviet um, republics. Um, at a fairly decent clip, it does have to be heat treated. Um, and so that is a regulation that protects the U.S. from potential infestations coming from that source of firewood overseas. Nobody's asked me any questions on chat, so I'm just sort of talking into the wind. If anybody has questions, please, really, just type it in. Um, I'm going to take a five-second break to drink some water. Thank you. Is it, you know, I see Kay Stolt says, so far so good. I appreciate that. Is that Kim? Am I remembering that right? I think, I think Kim we've emailed before, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, Christy, we have met. Excellent. It's nice to see you again. Uh, okay, so let's talk about spatially drawn regulations. So sometimes states, usually State Department of Agriculture or, or whatever the regulatory agency is for a state, Sometimes they decide that they would like to um, put in place a regulation to protect their natural resources and agriculture through the um, prevention of the movement of invasive species on firewood based on their legal authority to protect their state. And typically speaking, those um, are uh, held by the Department of Agriculture, like I said, but there is some variation within there. So the states that currently have a comprehensive external quarantine means that no type of firewood, neither um, softwood nor hardwood without exception is allowed to enter their state without some sort of heat treatment standard. Those are currently Florida, Illinois, Maine, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Virginia, and Wisconsin. They have different heat treatment standards depending on the state. Um, they both use, these states use typically either the um, quote emerald ash borer standard or the quote Asian longhorn beetle standard. Those are not their official names. Um, those are the states with comprehensive external quarantines on all firewood. Then we also have a number of states that have external quarantines on either just hardwood firewood, so excluding softwood, permitting softwood to enter, or on pest-based aspects of firewood. So there are situations in which untreated firewood would be allowed to be would be allowed to enter if the situation was very specifically deemed to be okay. And those are California, Minnesota, Oregon, and Utah. Those are a little bit of an outlier, um, but generally speaking, they do, all four of those states do regulate a great deal of firewood. It's just not a blanket regulation in the same way that the prior grouping was. Then we have the states from that thousand cankers disease map that we looked at before that are regulating thousand cankers disease origin state firewood only from entering their state. And those those external quarantines preventing the entrance of firewood from any of the thousand cankers disease infested states are on either all hardwood firewood, which is that first larger group starting with Indiana going to Wisconsin, or some of those state regulations are actually only walnut genus firewood. So juglans or yuglans, depending, depending on how you want to say that, um, species, walnut firewood. Um, and that is, a, that is a tricky regulation because if you think about it, how on earth are you going to determine whether or not firewood after it's been cut and bucked and processed and everything is from walnut? Um, so that one's a really, that's a tricky one right there. Um, and it is my personal opinion that um, it 
is a really difficult to enforce concept. Um, and I think the hardwood external quarantines for thousand cankerous disease have much better lasting power and enforceability than the um, walnut under only quarantines. So those are um, particularly complex rules and regulations we're, look, we're looking at in this case. Uh, there we go. Then, speaking of complex, land-owning entities, um, including federal uh, agencies, can and do put in place various uh, external quarantines to prevent the movement of firewood into their boundaries and potentially damaging their natural resources. Um, I have a list of the national parks that I uh, was able to verify most recently that have a regulation on the movement of firewood. These regulations definitely depend on the park and the regional pest situation. Sometimes the park will say only certified heat treated firewood can come in. Other times the park will say it has to be from within the same state as the park itself or from a given distance. It's entirely variable um, on both the administrators of the parks and like I said, the regional situation and what's most appropriate. This is the same thing for the national forests. Um, there's a number of national forests that say that you can't bring firewood from uh, various different metrics, whether it's 50 miles away or from out of state into their national forests in order to go camping and have a fire. Um, so that's some, a good example. The Army Corps of Engineers also has a regulation in some situations where you're not allowed to bring firewood to their recreation areas. Now, if you think about it, the Army Corps of Engineers has a lot of lakes. Um, or reservoirs and reservoirs, I guess. And so there's a lot of really fun, great camping going on um, around those bodies of water. It's a great place to vacation. So they actually have a lot of potential to bring, have um, firewood brought onto their properties by recreationalists. The Bureau of Land Management does not have any regulations that I know of. And part of that is because they do not um, have a uh, reservation system that's for campgrounds and campsites that's similar to the National Parks, National Forest, and Army Corps of Engineers. They're just a really different federal agency. And so um, the only things that they have is they do have some recommendations in place. Um, so I think that's worth mentioning that even though they don't have regulations, um, they do have national recommendations for the um, use of local firewood. Um, there's a lot of state parks and lands entities that maintain regulations in order to protect their trees. So for instance, the California state parks, there's significant problems with oak pests, not just sudden oak death, but also gold spotted oak borer. Um, and they have no oak firewood allowed in some of the parks in order to minimize the spread of those pests of oak. Similarly, Kentucky, Michigan, Tennessee, Wisconsin, they have, um, rules in order to minimize the movement of pests onto their state lands. Wisconsin State Parks has a really specific distance-based regulation that um, went down in the last few years. For a while it was 25 miles and now actually because of the scientific evidence that 10 miles would be more effective, they have changed their regulation to 10 miles away from the park or closer. Um, the Vermont State Parks asks that all firewood entering their parks is from Vermont itself to minimize the chance that emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, or other pests from the surrounding states will be um, brought into Vermont in that, those major camping areas. Uh, and Virginia State Parks has a really interesting rule that they have the ability to confiscate untreated firewood from an emerald ash borer infested county if it enters their park. Um, so I think that one's kind of fascinating. Um, the other uh, regulations listed here also include, you know, potential ramifications like confiscation, but that's the only one that says that as part of their core regulation, which I thought was really different. All right, it is also possible that I have missed one of the state parks um, that has these or misstated something here. So I'm just mentioning, you know, this uh, take this information with a grain of salt. It's very difficult to keep track of every one of these regulations um, because they do sometimes change uh, according to new laws or rescinding of laws and so forth. There, um, oh, you know what? I think I have a mistake here that I did not eliminate, which is I believe that Connecticut no longer has a less than state geographic boundary law. Um, I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, so one of the things that some states do when they have very limited infestations of, of particularly of, of emerald ash borers, they say that from one part of the state to the next, you're not allowed to move firewood. For a long time, Connecticut had this rule, but I 
I feel like they rescinded it last year and I did not reflect that in the PowerPoint, my apologies. Um, but I believe Iowa and Wisconsin still have those rules that even though the state has an infestation, you're just not permitted to move um, material from an infested area to a potentially uninfested area. Additionally, as we talked about before in the rapid Ohia death slide that was a ways back, Hawaii has an inter-island prohibition on the movement of Ohia wood, um, which of course Hawaii is a state and each of the islands is unique um, and separated by water, <laughs> but nonetheless, they have the right to make sure that things don't move island to island. Um, interestingly, there's a really fascinating aspect in Wyoming where they, the Wyoming Weed and Pest Control Act um, has a regulation put in place that emerald ash borer for Park County is a listed pest, and so they are able to say that in um, that you are not allowed to bring emerald ash borer into Park County, and if it does reach Park County, um, it would be permitted to um, get um, funding in order to control it. The reason this is worth mentioning is because Park County is the county that serves as the gateway to um, Yellowstone. And uh, you can see on that little tiny Google map at the bottom that it's, it's enormous. Um, it's almost as big as Yellowstone itself. It, uh, two years, three years ago now, it received 4.25 million visitors. Um, I will note that Wyoming itself has less than a million people, if I remember correctly. So that's a heck of a lot of visitors. Um, in a given year, and a tremendous number of those visitors are coming from the East Coast, and a lot of them are coming, or sorry, East Coast and Great Lakes area, and a lot of them are coming in RVs for their big family vacation, and in those RVs, they might have firewood. So Wyoming has some interesting proactive laws there that you're able to access, and Park County has put in place um, a regulation on emerald ash borer. The other counties of Wyoming could do the same, but they have not opted to. All right, last but um, definitely not least is the distance from origin regulations that exist. We already talked about how Wisconsin used to have a 25 mile and now it has a 10. Um, so that is one of the rules. There are also some interesting rules uh, in New York, Florida, and Oregon. Um, in New York, uh, regardless of where you are, you're not allowed to move firewood more than 50 miles from its uh, source and you have to have a self-certification of your firewood. So basically that's an education tool so that if anybody says where's your firewood from, you actually have documentation of it even though it's a self-documentation. Um, in Florida there is a 50 mile grace zone on the northern border of Florida where it interfaces with other states where if you have out-of-state firewood it is allowed to be imported as long as that firewood is sourced within 50 miles. Um, I think that's a really good way to kind of balance the concerns of commercial import of firewood from pests versus the sort of financial impacts of a regulation. I think that's an interesting um, grace zone concept. Uh, and in Oregon, they have essentially a, um, if it touches, it's not so bad rule, which is that, you know, firewood from the adjacent states of Washington and Idaho are probably going, is probably going to have a similar pest situation to Oregon itself, so you don't have to have that firewood heat treated before it enters the state of Oregon on the assumption that the region kind of works as a unit, which I think also is a really interesting way to balance commercial concerns versus pest uh, movement limitations. And like I said, Vermont and Wisconsin both have rules that we already talked about that have distance from origin basis. Oh man, what about Canada? They got all sorts of stuff up there. So they have lots of quarantines that we don't have, as well as ones that we do have. Um, so for instance, they have a pest we don't have called ground spruce longhorn beetle, which is found in the eastern um, provinces, which they call the Maritimes of Canada. And that is under an, uh, a traditional quarantine. So you're not allowed to bring material from that area outside. Um, Dutch elm disease also has not infested the province of Alberta, which is the one north of Montana, in case you can't remember your provinces. And that's amazing because there are um, almost a million elm trees in uh, Alberta, and they are primarily urban trees. And so they very carefully regulate the movement of firewood into Alberta to ensure that Alberta keeps its elm canopy and Dutch elm disease stays out of their, um, out of their province. 
Likewise, they have hemlock woolia adelgid infestations in Canada that are under quarantine regulations as well. Hemlock woolia adelgid typically is not really thought to be capable of moving on firewood. Um, balsam woolia adelgid is more the one that is a concern with firewood. However, it's a forest pest worth mentioning, so I thought I would just let you know. Uh, so um, I already covered the international boundary regulations and agencies and how they work from US to Canada. Um, individual different provinces, which is of course the parallel system to states, um, have their own laws. I talked about how Alberta has Dutch elm disease related law. Saskatchewan also, which is another prairie province in the middle, um, also has Dutch elm disease related uh, regulations on the books that pertain to firewood. Unfortunately, Winnipeg, which is one of the Prairie Province cities, um, now has emerald ash borer. That is a relatively new occurrence and, and detection. I'm not sure how that is going to change the legal situation for the Prairie Provinces. We'll see. Um, I think that's kind of a developing situation. As I understand it, it was literally found in like four trees. So they think that the infestation right now is really quite modest in size, but um, that's that'll develop over time in terms of what happens there. Um, Canada has national parks, just like the United States has national parks, and three of them that I was able to find, which are um, in Canada, have uh, prohibitions on outside firewood. The first two in Nova Scotia are found in the general adjacent region to the brown spruce longhorn beetles. So those two um, prohibit firewood from outside their park as a reactionary precaution to brown spruce longhorn beetle, if I had to sort of armchair it from here. Um, the Bruce Peninsula, which is an Ontario national park, is adjacent to numerous emerald ash borer infested areas, Ontario being um, the province that's north of the Great Lakes and um, most of the uh, eastern United States. Um, and so that's why Bruce Peninsula has a firewood regulation. I was not able to find any less than province size geographic boundary locations, uh, boundary uh, quarantines for Canadian province areas or zones um, that would serve as examples. They may exist though. Um, and I did not find any distance from origin in kilometer regulations. Uh, when I investigated the regulatory environment in Canada. I will also note that on the Doton Firewood website, uh, if you click on the firewood map, all of the provinces have a summary of their regulations and recommendations available. So if you're interested in researching further the legal situation of firewood movement in Canada, I highly recommend going to dotonfirewood.org slash map and checking that out. I think I have completed this in record time. It is 2.47 here in beautiful Missoula, Montana. So I just wanna say thank you to all of our partners throughout North America. Special thanks go to USDA APHIS, um, who is the entity that funds the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative, which is the um, group that hosts these webinars. Um, there are only nine people on the line, so we have plenty of time in order to do questions or comments. Um, and if you do have questions, uh, I highly recommend you put them in the chat, and then I can read them out loud. But if you'd like to take yourself off of mute and say them out loud that way, that's totally fine too. Um, so please, does anybody have any questions? Either you're on mute or nobody has a question. Those are the two. That's Schrodinger's mute cat. Oh, thank you for saying nice job. That's great. One thing that I didn't get into because it is really tricky is the ramifications of the Emerald Ash Board Deregulation um, proposal that went through this fall. Well, thank you for saying it was a nice summary of the current standards. <sighs> If emerald ash borer indeed is deregulated, what that means is that just that one first regulation, the one with the big green blob of ash trees on the map of North America, will be removed from this fantastically complicated set of regulations that we just took 47 minutes to go through. It does not mean that any of the other types of regulations will not exist, but what it does mean is the other types of regulations will exist in an environment without 
one of the best understood regulations in North America. And that's one of the things that's really important to keep in mind. The um, potential for confusion in the process of emerald ash borer deregulation is, if it goes through, is really, really high. Confusion by the public, confusion by professionals, you name it. Um, I think these sorts of webinars are really helpful for people because a lot of the times, you know, if you work for, for instance, a state agency, you might be under, you might understand the federal regulations and your state's regulations, but not the overall complexity of all of the park regulations um, and regional regulations and so forth. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty tricky situation. All right. Um, so Kim Corellis says, what would be a good place to start in trying to implement a regulation on firewood movement in the state? We have many new invasive insects that are spreading on firewood, and this is becoming increasingly important. So um, there's two types of state-based firewood regulations, um, and you have to decide if you want to do one or, or two. Uh, one is if you think about the movement of firewood within your state. So if you want to do a, um, a within-state regulation or a distance-based regulation to slow the spread of things inside your state. Now, obviously, Kim, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what state you're in, but if you're in Delaware, it might be a little bit too small for that to be practical. If you're in a big state, those might be really important. Further, if you're talking about an external quarantine, California, so plenty big. <laughs> um, so if you're talking about an external quarantine, um, the National Plant Board is actually going through a really interesting process of evaluating all of the different um, regulations for external quarantines held by states right now. And the president of the National Plant Board, who's a woman named Ann Gibbs from Maine, and the vice president of the Eastern Plant Board, which is another woman named Pierre Siegert from New Hampshire, are going to be giving a webinar on all of those progress items next week. That's going to be our next webinar in the series. Um, and they're going to be talking about how to research and potentially create external fire regulations. Now, if we're talking about in the state, which is what you said, that is um, something that's really difficult to tackle, partially because the, um, the problem of political will and funding becomes really paramount when you're not talking about protecting yourself from an, an, another entity. So for instance, if California was trying to prevent the movement of firewood in from you know, other states, it's politically and logistically far more simple to do that because you have border protection stations, you have um, your own Department of Agriculture. When you talk about trying to actually regulate the movement of firewood within a given state, you know, border protection stations don't matter because you're already in the state. That's where the role of um, state parks authorities uh, can and um, forestry agencies, so in your case, like CAL FIRE, I suspect would be um, brought in and so forth, you know, making sure that all of the different state entities within your state are delivering outreach and when feasible, um, sensible regulations on the movement of firewood within your state to create a state culture of not moving firewood long distances. Because I think in that case, a regulation is actually regrettably very unrealistic. It's still desirable, but I just don't see how it would really happen. Um, and I know that, for instance, in my home state in Montana, we are looking at that sort of um, multifaceted approach to re reducing the amount of firewood movement within the state of Montana by looking at our Department of Natural Resources, our state parks authority, those are separate in Montana, in some states they're the same, our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks um, group, you know, if they can create either firewood outreach or firewood regulations that are sensible, then the Montana Department of Natural Resources can back them up. So it creates this sort of um, network of cooperating agencies that all work to educate the public consistently on the topic of firewood. And I think that's really the best place to start. So for instance, in, in California, you've got a California Firewood Task Force, you know, making sure that all the agencies buy into that process and really have um, full ownership of the importance of the issue would be uh, critically important for a big state with lots of different parties like California. Yes, it is really hard to get traction on it in state quarantines. Um, they are really hard to put in place. Um, especially when you've got a lot of different pests in a lot of different areas, it's kind of hard to understand the importance of them if you're, um, you know, a 
just not involved in forest pests. It's, it's tough stuff. These are, you know, these are big and very expensive problems. Um, they're not exactly uh, fun to deal with. So we got five more minutes um, before everybody is gonna go make themselves a snack or if you're on the East Coast, head on home, I guess. Um, so any other questions, I will be posting this online. So if you have a colleague or new hire that you think could really use listening to me for 55 minutes, um, you can go ahead and send them the link as soon as it's ready. I'm hoping to have the recording um, posted in a few days. So, you know, check back Monday. Um, I am also looking forward to next week's webinar. Thank you for that product placement. So the National Plan Board webinar um, that I'm going to be hosting will is listed on dotmcfireworth.org slash blog. That's where we post our webinars. Um, so log in there, put the time on your calendar. Anne and Pira are hoping to um, speak for 30 minutes and then do 30 minutes of question and answer. Uh, so it'll be a different format from this one. And um, I think it'll be really fascinating. Very different perspective. All right, thank you so much for joining. And uh, unless there's a one late breaking chat question, I am going to close on up. All right, that's it. Have a great day, everybody.